Hello, my guest today is Leanne Davis of Live Learn and we first met years ago when we were both associate trainers for the same company and in fact I did Leanne's train the trainer course and it has made me a better trainer these days. Hi Jackie, it's lovely to see you again and it's so great that we're going to chat all things learning. I know that what you do now is make learning come alive. What I help people do is to be able to design or facilitate their next meeting or workshop so that it's focused, it is meaningful, it involves everybody and really gets them to do their best thinking. And you may ask, well, how do we get people to do their best thinking? Well, people do their best thinking when they're feeling relaxed, when they're feeling perhaps playful, when they're feeling calm, when they're feeling enthusiastic about what they need to do. Now, I believe that, you know, learning is always alive because we're always learning. We're wired to learn. We're always thinking, trying to make sense of things and then to apply it. And of course, it's much more helpful if we're in, a, in, a, in an environment and have relationships where that actually enables that to happen. But now in the way that we're trying to learn online, the online world, that isn't all, if we don't know how to do this, it doesn't always set us up for success for our learning. Because think about it, when we're working online, especially in a meeting or maybe running a workshop or we've been part of a learning experience, what we find is that people come to the session, meeting, workshop, some of them are scared. Some of them want to hide. They don't feel very confident. They're incredibly self-conscious. And this is not the position we want to be in when we want to learn something new. Um, I believe that when people come together, there is a richness of um, experience, of knowledge, of skill that we would be silly not to try and make the most of when we're all together. So we need to be able to tap into that, hear what it sounds like, get people to articulate it, share it with others so that we can learn from each other. You mentioned online learning just there, which is something that we are all currently doing a lot of, mm. along online learning and online training. Are there real differences in how a trainer or a speaker delivers their content online to engage an audience compared with offline? In my experience over the last couple of months when we've had to make this rapid change from, you know, in the room with people in a physical space, seeing people face to face, um, to moving online where everyone feels quite separate. My experience has been that I cannot take my, my, my material that I've used before and then just sort of copy and paste it onto an online session because the entire experience, you know, the entire experience is different. You can't just get people into groups or get people to shout out or whatever the case is or quickly pick up a pen and write on a flip chart like you used to. Or if things took a different direction, you could just dip into your toolkit and think, you know, come up with something new to help with the discussion and get the learning going. Um, when you're online, you need to be much more prepared. Uh, what I found is that our instructions have to be much, much more clearer. And things have to be slowed down a bit and they've got to be a little bit more measured. And that could lead to people being um lulled into something becoming quite boring what the learner does is much more important than what the teacher does now this is a quote from jeff petty he's one of the uk's and um, leading experts on teaching and but this can be applied in anything whether you whether you're in a meeting or whether you're in a workshop with adults so it's not what the presenter is doing or what the trainer is doing, but it's what the team is doing in that meeting or the attendees or the delegates or the learners. That's when the real learning takes place. So when we're designing a meeting or we're designing a workshop, yes, we need to put a lot of work in 
putting it together because we need to know what we want to achieve by that and we need to design it in such a way but who is doing the work on the day of the meeting or the workshop is the people attending because they're the ones that need to learn and share the ideas and so when we're designing we need to be able to put together an environment that um, enables that i see each of us as being learning enablers whether you're a team member whether you're a colleague or whether you the supervisor or team leader or managing director and what kind of tools are there that learning enablers can use to bring their learning to life well, what I've discovered, the tools that actually make the most sense, again, and I'm going to repeat myself, but it's when the learners do the work. Because, you know, they come with the knowledge, they come with skills, they come with experience. What I want to say is that there are a lot of tools. It, it's the tools that get the people to think and to reflect are the ones that make the biggest difference. So another saying that I like to use is don't tell when you can ask. Because like I said earlier, people bring so much to that meeting or to that classroom or to that online session. And that's what we need to tap into. And that's what we can, you know, and that's what we can learn from. And we want to get people to be thinking about their experiences and helping them to learn from it. Because we don't always think about what we're learning about and how we can apply it. And some tools that I've come across uh, lately are called liberating structures. Okay. They are very, very simple methods that anybody can use. But what they do is they help people to interact with one another in a way that makes learning come alive, that gets people to do this thinking and this sharing and this contributing, but in a way that people feel safe, they feel confident and they feel heard. Can you give me an example of a liberating structure? Yes, Jackie, I can. Um, the one structure that is proven very popular and that makes a huge difference is called one, two, four and all. And seeing this in practice looks like this. You will, ask, you will ask your team or, the, or your learners to maybe come up either with a suggestion or an idea or even to come up with questions. So when you want information from them, what you will do is you'll give them an invitation or a prompt. The one I used on Tuesday was, what makes great learning? Um, the one in the one, two, four, all stands for you're going to give everybody one minute to reflect individually on your question and to come up with a list of things. I bring them back, uh, I bring them back together and I say to them, right, now you've got two minutes. You're going to get into pairs. And what I'd like you to do is to share your lists and come up with a new list. And so I send them into breakouts and people share their lists in their pairs for two minutes and then I'll bring them back. And then we have another round and this is where the four comes in. I'll put them into bigger groups. Now, of course, if I've got an even number, the one, two, four all works well, but uh, I might say one, three, five, for example. And um, so I'll put them into bigger groups and there they will com you know, compare their lists and then come up with a, a new list. And then I'll bring them all back into the main room um, and then we share our top five or our top three, but everybody gets a chance, each group gets a chance to share their, their, their final list. Now, what makes this a special structure is that it, it gets everybody to contribute, which is key, but in a way that when we start, there's time for that individual reflection which is key. All those years ago, one of the things I remember from when you trained me was that you introduced the Bloom taxonomy. Can you say more about that? Okay, so one of my favorite people is Bloom. Right? His name is Benjamin Bloom. And he came up with the theory that said, when we're learning, we operate in th mainly three domains. And that's the head, the cognitive domain, the heart, the affective domain, 
and then the skills or the psychomotor domain. And in the theory, he goes on to say that in each of the domains, we go through different levels of learning. And let's take an example of, our, of the cognitive domain, when we're wanting to learn knowledge, for instance. The most simple level of learning knowledge is to be able to recognize information. You may not know what it all means, but you're able to recognize it. So I could say, the bus is red. I say, what color is the bus, Jackie? It's a red bus, Leanne. It's a red bus. You may not know what the color red looks like, and you may not even know what a bus is, but you can say those words and you can recognize this information, perhaps if I had to show it to you, or even, you know, just while we're speaking. The next level is about comprehension. So it's a, now we're getting into the understanding of what the knowledge is about. Um, and as you work your way through these levels, there's six, we get to what we call, or what he calls, um, synthesizing, where you can put things together, and evaluating, where you can actually critically judge or assess something. And he's saying that it could be difficult to make an assessment or judge something when you don't have the basics in place of understanding, you know, the key concepts, for instance. When we're putting our, um, our course together or our session together or our meeting together, we need to know what the outcome is going to be. We need to have an objective. And well, it's like that with everything. If you don't have an objective, you don't quite know where you're going. So when we're setting an objective, begin with the end in mind. So at the end of the session, you will be able to, I mean, that, that's a really good idea to start like that because you begin with the end in mind, taken from Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits. But we're thinking about, okay, so at the end of the session, your learners, your attendees, your delegates, your team will be able to what? Well, this is where Bloom's magic comes in, because for each of those levels, we can attach certain action words or verbs. So at the end of the session, my um, learners will be able to demonstrate something, or they will be able to solve something, or they'll be able to label something, or they'll be able to list something. So the, having those verbs in place actually allows us to know what levels of learning we're taking people through. So for example, if my session um, consisted of six objectives and we were just talking about labeling and listing things, we would just be keeping them at that basic level of learning. And maybe that's what people need for that session. Um, but if we want to stretch people and make learning come alive, we want to be able to take people through all those levels of learning so they can learn more, do more, apply more. Um, and this is, where, this is where Bloom is really, really helpful. It helps us to set our objectives, but with, um, with a real focus and, and, and meaning in mind. And people can actually feel that they've actually, you know, that they are making progress from listing and labeling to actually um, critically evaluating something. And while you were explaining all of that, you had quite a lively dog in the background. Yes, that's lively dogs times two. I've got two, I've got two um, mixed breeds. They are Jack Russell mixed with Patterdale. So there are two types of terriers. So I always say that I've got um, two terriers squared. Um, going back to my memory of the course that we did together, uh, one of the activities you had us do was a sorting exercise where you'd shared some theory um, and then you gave us this uh, practical activity and the purpose of it is to check our understanding. It was the part of training that until that point I hadn't really adopted but now of course I do all the time. How can you do something like a sorting activity online, do you think? Right, so you've, you've just mentioned a very key aspect of, um, 
of, of training. And that is, it's not just about sharing information or trying to transfer skill and using an appropriate method to do that. But it's also to check to see whether people have actually learned, which you know we call assessment in the training world. So we always need to build in an assessment method. And a sorting activity is an excellent training and assessment method because you don't actually have to tell people anything. You can just get them to sort things and they make sense um, of what they need to do. So they're actually, you're actually um, training and assessing at the same time because if people can match the different things together and or put the pieces of the puzzle together, um, then they can, you know, they're making sense of it and you know they're taking something away. Um, how do we do sorting activities online? Well, every day there are many more, I mean, they're great online tools to use. So I, for example, will use something called Jamboard. So that's on Google Drive. I also use something called um, Padlet. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about are all, you, have, they all have, you can have free accounts with those. Obviously, if you want to do more and make them fancier, you can pay a subscription. Um, it just depends how much you want to use it. Um, another one we can use is something called Mural or Ideas Flip. 99% um, of things that we can do or we used to be able to do in an actual physical uh, meeting room, if we think a little bit more about it and think about, right, so what must the learner be able to do? What must my team member be able to do, there are ways to do that online. We just need to be a little bit more creative um, and just, you know, explore all these different um, online tools. And people have such fun using them. I, I um, facilitated a session on Tuesday and, um, you know, the feedback that I was getting was, wow, I didn't realize time could go so quickly on Zoom. You know, I didn't realize it could be so fun and I've learned so much and things like, oh, I can't believe I can actually do this stuff. I'm going to, you know, take it back to my team. You know, that's what we want to hear in, in learning. Absolutely. And as you know, that's what drove my experiential speaking book a couple of years ago and the new book coming about online engagement, work in progress. But that connects to the other model the Kolb experiential learning model. Can you talk us through that one? Yes, another favourite of mine, as you can hear, I've got lots of favourites, is um, David Kolb's experiential learning cycle. So what Kolb is saying, this was in the 1980s, he said that we all experience something, right? I mean, we're experiencing something now, this conversation. Once we've experienced something, we reflect on it. So we think what went well, what didn't go so well, what did I enjoy, what didn't I enjoy? Um, I wonder why that is. And then by doing, by doing that reflection, by getting that time to reflect, I then start making some conclusions about my experience. And once I've made those few conclusions, I think, oh, next time I do this, I'm going to do it this way. This is what I'm not going to do. This is what I'm going to keep doing. And this perhaps is something that I'm going to try. And so therefore you put a little, an action plan together and you practice what you're going to do. And then by doing that, of course, it feeds into having another experience. All good advice for those of us who are speakers and trainers, because that's what we're trying to do for our audiences is make a difference. Just yes. nudge them along to take a different action or, or a different attitude yes. or a different approach. And that's one of the things you do now, isn't it, Leanne, that you help people design their own training programs? Yes. And how can people contact you to find out more? www.livelearn.org.uk um, They can also contact me directly by using an email. And that is leanne at livelearn.org.uk. Um, and I'm also happy to share my mobile number. Yeah, 078 triple nine three one 
double two nine. I pronounced it live learn, you pronounced it live learn, but I think it works on both levels. It Thanks does. very much, Leanne. It's a great pleasure. It's been lovely to see you and thank you for letting me share my thoughts um, about learning with you.